If you're visiting with us this morning, welcome. We've been reading through the book of Proverbs as a body, and we are preaching through the book of Acts. And this morning we come to Acts chapter 8. Also this morning we will be taking communion together. Taking communion together is, is extremely joyful. The reason it's so joyful is because of the reality of what the sacrifice of Jesus actually accomplished. In terms of the gospel message, Paul told the Corinthian believers that he had delivered to them, as a matter of first importance, what he had also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to to the scriptures. But did you notice that Paul said that this gospel message that he was proclaiming was a message he himself had first received? So think about it with me. How, how did the gospel message come to Paul? In a few weeks, we'll be talking about the conversion of Saul and the fact that Jesus, Jesus himself spoke very di directly and very dramatically to him. But remember just last week, we also learned that those who stoned Stephen laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul, which means there is a good chance that Paul, or Saul, as he was called at the time, there's a good chance he actually heard Stephen publicly witness about Jesus. We know that Saul approved of his execution. So there is a very good chance that he heard Stephen publicly witness by calling out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now taking communion together is also a public witness. It is a witness that we are proclaiming to the heavenly realm. It's a witness that we are proclaiming to one another. It's a witness that we are proclaiming to the world, that we are dependent upon Jesus and his sacrifice for our salvation. But this witness to the gospel message about the sacrifice of Jesus, the message we are proclaiming we believe, is a message that we too first received. So think for a moment about how the gospel message came to you. How did the message of the gospel come to you so that you could receive it? Who shared the good news of the gospel with you? What were the circumstances around your conversion? Further, how did the person who proclaimed the gospel to you, how did that person first receive the gospel? Maybe you have no idea. In my case, I, I certainly don't. But if, if, we, trace, if we trace your story, and, and we trace my story, we trace Kevin's story, 
and cats. Fritz's story. If we trace each story back to the beginning, this, this passage, today's passage, is the place where the story begins for each one of us. For today's passage is the story about how the gospel first went out from Jerusalem to all who might one day believe its glorious message. And our passage is Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. Recall that Stephen has just been martyred. Hear then the word of God, beginning in verse 1. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits came out of many who were possessed, crying with a loud voice, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Lord, would you lead us now by your spirit? Strengthen us and encourage us as we consider consider the reality of the circumstances of the church in its very first days. And I pray that as a result, you would embolden our faith. And I ask these things through the same spirit that empowered Philip. And in the name of Jesus, our beloved Lord, amen. So in many ways, our passage is just a brief summary of what was happening at at this particular moment in the church's history. But the power of this passage is found in the details of what we are told. Our main point this morning is drawn from verse 4. Wherever the church is scattered, the seed of the gospel is sown. Wherever the church is scattered, the seed of the gospel is sown. So this morning, let's look at the fact that the church was taking root and being uprooted in Jerusalem in verses 1 through 3. It's taking root in Jerusalem and it's being uprooted from Jerusalem at the same time. And then in verses 4 through 8, let's look at this reality, that the Christ was being proclaimed and proving his power. Now, Luke uses really strong language to describe what is happening. He uses words and phrases like great persecution and devout men and great lamentation and ravaging the church and one accord and much joy. I think all of this helps us to understand that what was happening was extreme. To borrow language from Charles Dickens, we might say this time in church history was the best of times and the worst of times. At the same time. Now, at the beginning of our passage, we note 
the mention of Saul, who will take center stage in the book of Acts, beginning in chapter 9. But the overarching point is that the martyrdom of Stephen was the flashpoint that ignited a vicious attack against the church. The effect was that followers of Jesus were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. When you read that, let the words of the resurrected and now ascended Christ be reverberating in your ears. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is the plan and it's being fulfilled. But there's a tension There's a tension that becomes immediately apparent because these words of Jesus from Acts 1-8, they're so so positive. They're so triumphant. They're They're so dominant. They're so authoritative. They're so unlike the devastating reality that the church is facing after Stephen is killed. So what do we do with that? Maybe you've experienced a similar type of tension in your own life. The promises of God often seem and in fact are so wonderful, so encouraging. They're they're so peace-filled. They're so joyful. And yet, sometimes the circumstances of our lives feel like anything but that. We know that Jesus is the reigning king of all creation, and yet we often find ourselves in in, in situations that, that test our faith. And tempt us to to doubt all of the things that we believe to be true about Jesus. So as it relates to our passage, imagine the horror. It's just a typical evening at home. You're at your table with your Family, you're kind of laughing and, and talking about the day. And then all of a sudden, the authorities storm into your house, led by a young man named Saul. And they seize mom and dad. There is no warning. There is no mercy. And there is no escape. The reality is that that part of our witness to the world, part of the way that Jesus demonstrates his, his supremacy in the world is through the church's faithfulness, spirit led faithfulness in the midst of suffering. This is part of the plan. It's how the gospel is sown. There is no way around it. For believers, one of the main reasons we know and believe that God's promises are as good and as true as he proclaims them to be is because in large measure, we learn the fullness of their power in our desperation. As we walk through times when the anguish of our soul feels unbearable, Indeed, in our own strength, it might be. 
So whether, whether your future is uncertain, as you sit here this, this very morning, or maybe you're walking through what has been the most excruciatingly painful season of your life. Even if that's true, know that the spirit who created the universe, who had been hovering over the waters, the spirit who raised Christ from the dead, the spirit who has fellowshiped with the Father and the Son from eternity past. This same spirit dwells within you and he is capable of sustaining your soul even through this. Even now. Believer in Jesus, taste and see that even in life's most bitter providences, taste and see that the Lord is is good. Rely on his incomparable strength and, and, and throw yourself, throw yourself upon his inexhaustible mercy. He can and he will sustain you. For he, he, he who began a good work he who began a good work in you, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Rest, trust in the promises of God for they are in fact true. Now, Despite the good news in our passage, the good news that the good news of the gospel is heading to Samaria in verses four through eight, in verses one through three, we learn that the reason the church is on the move is because it's being uprooted from Jerusalem. But even as the persecution scatters the church, we also see that the roots of the gospel are deepening and growing. There arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church. We see that the roots of the gospel are, are, are deepening and growing because of two key phrases in these verses. Though the church was scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, this phrase is tacked on, except the apostles. The apostles stayed. They stayed to minister to and to lead this, this little remnant, this, this church which, which had begun in Jerusalem. And while the church is largely on the move, the second key phrase is that devout men, faithful brothers, faithful brothers who are not ashamed of the gospel or of the church's first martyr, at, at very great risk to themselves, they stayed in Jerusalem to honor Stephen, their fallen brother. So the gospel is taking root in Jerusalem, because the gospel isn't some traveling sideshow that blows out of town as quickly as it came in. Rather, where the seed of the gospel has taken root, it continues to grow and to deepen. These brothers stay in the eye of the storm because the gospel has taken root in their own hearts, and therefore a witness remains. Now, lamentation is the is the, the passionate expression of, of grief or of sorrow. And these brothers made, made great lamentation over Stephen. In other words, they weren't shy about it. Often when we're grieving, we tend to be really, really private. That's not true in all cultures, and it certainly wasn't true in first century Jerusalem. 
And even their grief over Stephen was a witness to the gospel truths to which Stephen testified. I want you to think about this, especially if brokenness is a large part of your life. We can be just as faithful to God in our lament as we can in our joy if we are trusting God through it. That is massively important for us to understand and for us to live in light of. Because the, the Bible, if it's nothing else, is very real about the, both the pain and the joy of the world. And there's no reason we need to be ashamed of either. So if you grieve, grieve with all your might to the glory of God as you trust in Christ through faith. And if you're joyful, rejoice to the glory of God by the power of the Spirit as you express faith in Jesus Christ. Now, all of this was, was happening while Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house. This word ravaging is a word that describes an especially cruel or, or sadistic rampage. Since, since Saul is Paul, think for a moment about his relentless passion for the gospel. And then imagine its fervor fortifying his unconverted heart against the gospel message. He destroyed families. And make no mistake, it didn't stop as him putting them into prison, verse 3. Chapters 9 and chapters 22 and chapters 26 of Acts all tell us he was seeking to kill those he captured. Both men and women without mercy. One of the things that testifies to the authenticity of the New Testament is that Luke was one of Paul's closest companions and he's not holding anything back in Acts about the reality of the situation. Paul was this wicked and he was transformed that radically. When Paul calls himself the chief of sinners, he's not attempting to sound humble. He views himself as the worst possible sinner imaginable. Because before he devoted his life to serving the church, he had devoted his life to destroying it. Nonetheless, in these opening verses, we see the church both taking root in Jerusalem and being uprooted from Jerusalem. Now, the intense opposition and, and the backdrop of great lamentation, through it we learn the joyful news in verse 4 that as the believers are scattered, they are preaching or they are proclaiming the gospel wherever they go. The church's mission always has been and always will be filled with both great pain and great joy. And we see both of those on full display in this passage. I love that it says, not just Philip, but all those who were scattered went about preaching the word. This is a good reminder. It's a good reminder that no matter what area of life you're talking about, uh, no matter what's trending on Twitter, no matter where the specific cultural wars are being fought on any given day, <laughs> 
the most important reality that is always at work in this world is the proclamation of the gospel as the kingdom of God advances on earth. If you think about that carefully and you believe it, it's incredibly freeing. I mean, with everything that's going on in our culture, let's say that a short time in the future, you get fired from a good paying or a very secure job because you cannot sign the document that your HR director says you must sign in order to continue your employment. But as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, you cannot sign it with a clear conscience. And so you, you lose your job. And because you're making much less now, as you look for another job and, and eventually find one, you have to move. You move from your, your current home into another neighborhood. Is this a tragedy? Is this something we should be frustrated by and, and, and shaking our fist at the government? Or is something else far more important going on behind the scenes? Is not, if we are thinking clearly as believers about the Great Commission, is not the most likely reason that you lost your job and had to find another job is not the most likely reason for this development that God is doing things in you to sanctify you and God desires to minister to other people through you, both in your new job and in your new neighborhood. Instead of worrying about what we might lose in this world because of gospel persecution, let's fix our minds on what we will gain in the world to come because of our gospel proclamation. God may use us as the human means to bring others into the joy of his kingdom. That's a job worth celebrating forever. What will be worth more one day? Having a few extra hundred thousand dollars in your 401k and a house with an extra bedroom? Or the eternal joy of being sent by God to some place you would not have chosen to go to snatch others out of the fire as you contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. What's more important? If we're thinking clearly about the gospel, seriously, nothing. It's so obvious. There is no comparison at all. So don't be afraid. God will lead you to the place that he wants you to go for the sake of the gospel. Wherever the church is scattered, and for whatever reason the church is scattered, including individual people within this body. The plan is that the seed of the gospel would be sown to the ends of the earth. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ, verse 5. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits came out of many who were possessed, crying with a loud voice. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. So it's stunning in verses five through eight to see that Philip is proclaiming the gospel with such clarity and with such power. The reason that it's stunning is because Philip isn't an apostle. The Philip in this scene is not the apostle Philip mentioned back in chapter one and 
verse 13 with the apostles, as, as Jill was alluding to earlier, that Philip presumably stayed with the rest of the apostles in Jerusalem because that's what the text tells us. This Philip, along with Stephen, who was just martyred, Philip was one of the seven men chosen to serve at the church at the beginning of chapter 6. So in a sense, Luke is chronicling two lives, the life of Stephen and the life of Philip, neither of whom were apostles, both of whom proclaimed the Christ with clarity and performed amazing signs and wonders through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of and commissioned by the one reigning at the right hand of the Father in glory, namely Jesus Christ, our majestic Lord. Last January, and and by that I mean January 2020, I, I shared the story of traveling to Guatemala with my son Jack and his class from Maryville Christian School. While we were visiting some remote Mayan ruins, we came upon a man named Alexander. And I shared this story when we got back from the trip. He was offering sacrifices to a Mayan god when we saw him. And the reason he drew our attention, because he was kind of off a little bit on the edge of the woods in, in an area much lower than where we were, we saw the smoke coming up from his sacrifice. So we headed down the steps to proclaim the Christ to him. When I shared this idea, I didn't go into detail at the time, but I said it was a very book of Acts type of experience for me and for us. It was for a number of reasons, but in particular, because of the way that the Spirit led me to share with Alexander as the students and the teachers were praying. As I approached Alexander with an interpreter who just happened to speak ancient Kiche, which was Alexander's language, I borrowed Paul's language from Acts 17 and told him that I could perceive that he was a very religious man. And I told him that I was also a very religious man. And he seemed to appreciate that because he listened carefully to what I said to him, especially as I proclaimed the good news of the gospel to him. The second reason that it seemed very Book of Acts-ish to me is that I was thinking about this very section of Scripture. I was was thinking about the way that God attested to the faithful proclamation of the gospel with signs and wonders. And I thought, God might want to do this in this context, in this situation right now. Now, and so it felt very book of Acts-ish to me, very led by the spirit to me, because this, this wouldn't be the typical way that I would engage someone with the good news of the gospel. But I asked him why he was sacrificing, and he told me that the, the people that were sitting near us were sick. And so I said to him, would it be okay with you if I laid my hands on them and asked Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, to heal them? And if they, would, if they were healed, would you consider that the good news of the gospel that I'm proclaiming to you about Jesus might actually be, in fact, true? He declined saying that his sacrifice would heal them. Our prayer for him. Oh, and I I hope 
I hope we all meet Alexander one day. Our prayer as a group for him, and not just our group, this church who was praying at the same time, and also, in addition to that, other churches in Blount County were praying for this man at the same time. Since he, since he declined for me to lay my hands on, on the people that were with him, I asked him if he would consider praying. And tomorrow morning, this happened on a Saturday, tomorrow morning, on a Sunday morning, would you pray? Would you pray to Jesus and ask Jesus to reveal himself to you as the one and only true God, if that is in fact true? And he agreed to do that. Oh, so my great hope is that he, he is in heaven, but our prayer for him was that he and his whole household and his whole village would be saved and that he would return to that exact spot as an evangelist for Jesus Christ, just like Philip. So my thought process was, as I sought to be led by the Holy Spirit and as others were praying for me, I thought that God might want to attest to the proclamation of the gospel by also doing signs and wonders in this particular instance, much like he did with Stephen and Philip. The reason I felt confident to proceed in the manner I did is the same reason that Philip was able to preach with such clarity and such power. Jesus the Christ was being proclaimed, and I thought Jesus might want to prove his power in this situation, just like he did when Philip proclaimed the good news about him in Samaria. The opportunity did not present itself fully. And to be clear, I had no idea what God was going to do. As we start to think about communion now, consider what a miracle it was that Philip was proclaiming the gospel in Samaria. Verse 8. There was much joy in that city. In the, in the city or the region of Samaria. The hatred between Jews and Samaritans was, was many, many generations old. Even Jesus himself in Matthew 10, 5, when he sent out the apostles for the first time, he said, don't go to the region of Samaria. Don't go to the Gentiles. Stay to the sheep of Israel. Jews considered Samaritans at best to be on the fringe kind of between God's people and, and, and the Gentiles. So Philip's proclamation about Jesus crossed ethnic and religious lines. And people came to see that Jesus and Jesus alone is the way and the truth and the life. Now the Samaritans revered the books of Moses but they rejected the rest of the Old Testament. They believed the Messiah would be a prophet like Moses. The Jews believed that the Christ or the Messiah would be a king in the, in the line of David. So as we prepare our hearts to receive communion together, let's acknowledge that both of those points are in fact true if not complete. So let's add one more to it. The Messiah to come. Indeed, the Messiah who has come would also be a priest, a great high priest whose sacrifice of himself for the forgiveness of sins as a matter of first importance is what we are celebrating this morning. Jesus is the prophet Moses wrote about. Jesus is the priest whose sacrifice and ministry renders all other priestly ministry obsolete. And Jesus is the descendant of David who is reigning on high even at this moment and whose kingdom will have no end. So when we consider all of these titles, is there any other proper response 
but awe. That a being this glorious offered his life in exchange for yours so that your sins, your scarlet sins might be forgiven and you might be dressed in his righteousness forever. Our sins, because of the sacrifice that we are celebrating, our sins have been forgiven fully and forever. This is the gospel we received. This is the gospel that we are called to proclaim. And this is the reason we still celebrate this sacrifice 2,000 years later. Thank you.